So I will slowly start. We are still missing some people, but they probably are upstairs and will come in a couple of minutes. But I welcome you to this um, Wednesday afternoon session of the HCH 2023. And um, I'm very glad that we have another keynote talk um, this afternoon of Dr. Simon Gabe. And uh, I quickly do an introduction of him before I hand over the microphone for the presentation. So uh, Dr. Simon Gabe studied in Paris for Sorbonne and St. Andrews. Um, Simon Gabe left to write his doctoral thesis in Latin um, philo philology, philology um, at the University of Amsterdam on the history of the actor in the, uh, in the Middle Ages. For his postdoctorate, he focused his research on computational philology as part of an SNSF project on the manuscripts of Madame de Sevigne um, at the University of Neuchâtel, where he teaches digital humanities. In 2020, in 2020 he joined um, the chair of uh, Beatrice Choyer Brunel. You remember she was also a keynote speaker at the first DHCH in 2021. Uh, um, at the University of Geneva as a senior lecturer where he directs two projects, actually a um, Ditiones, a corporate tool for the study of classical French, then Catabase, a database for manuscripts in uh, circulation of the private market. And his, his main areas of research are modern French philology, his, uh, the history of philology, classical literature, automatic language processing and optical character recognition. And today, um, Simon is talking about uh, from analog to digital data, tools and methods, um, a title which fits very, very well to the topic of data sciences. Thank you, Simon. Hi to everyone. I mean, at least those that have not uh, met until now, and those who could be online, I'm just like sounding a little mm -hmm. clock so that I know where I am in the presentation. So here to present like from analog to digital data, tools and methods. Obviously, I'll be focusing on things that I do and that I know the, the best. And um, this is what I do on a daily basis. When I study data with literature, it's the kind of visualization that I try to get. Here it's a study of the evolution of tragedy over time. So you can see on the left side of the graph, it's 1550 and at the end it's 1800, how it has evolved. Basically what we have done is that we have computed a centroid sort of average play that does not exist with all the linguistic features of the plays average. And we have seen how far all the plays are from this abstract average of what is a tragedy. And we can see that the lower the point is, the closer it is from this centroid, which means that tragedies tends to look alike. This is extremely interesting. It's the kind of thing that you want to do when you do digital humanities, except that there is a tiny problem. That what we need to do is that is machine actionable information. So rather than data, I'd like to talk about information, which is a word that we have used here more or less, but with this distinction is that data would be, from my perspective of a philologist, something that is more raw and unorganized, and that information is something that is organized. We will see what it means. Machine actionable, we will see also what it means. It means that basically you can use it with a computer. The problem is that most of this data, information, is not machine actionable. Why? Because it's in an old manuscript written in the 12th century, and you cannot do anything with a computer with this manuscript. What you have to do is to transform this ink on a parchment or on a leaf of paper into something that you can use to do this kind of graph. How do we do that? Big question, who is we? It's a question that is addressed quite a lot, especially when you're talking about infrastructure and digital humanities. But who is we? Is it me? Because me, I know how to run my own things, right? I don't care about the others. Are we talking about DH specialists, like people who have more or less the same knowledge than me or could learn to do the same thing? 
Are we talking about researchers specialized in human sciences? GLAM, so galleries, libraries, uh, museums, uh, uh, archives? Because how I work is with this little thing there, common lines. I access the HPC cluster, which is the supercomputer of the university with common lines. I send data, train models, book GPUs, which is like a lot of words that probably a lot of you here have never heard. So you cannot do it. And big question is like, so who are we? And we'll try to come back to that. Then information, just to be clear what we're talking about also, I think a very good example of what we can do. Here on the left, you have a very old print in French in Gothic script. It's a Gothic bâtard, very special kind of, of print. And there is there are two words, c'est bien, that you have on the upper right. What is that thing? Well, the first thing is that it's something that is on the page at a certain place. It's there. But this is important because it's not like dialogue. Dialogue is in big on the top. And obviously, there is a different status if you are on the top written in capital letters or if you just like a bunch of words on the line that is average. Second thing is that, OK, you have pixels. You have identified c'est bien. How do you transcribe that thing? What is the information that is in it? Well, here first, you see that there is a long S that is not a normal S, something that has disappeared from many languages. You see that it's not spelled properly. Aujourd'hui, or today, you would write it S-A-I-S. So do you modernize or not? Do you keep it or not? Bien, there is an abbreviation. Do you keep the abbreviation? or not. But you can even go further because, so there is a normalized version. There are several variants of writing of the same spelling that you could find in the book or in all the texts. You could also limitize it, which means to be very brief, to attach a word to its entry in a dictionary. So when it's conjugated, you don't care. It's always être, to be. And it could be I am, you are, and you don't care, it's the lemma. Or you could be post-tag, which means if it's a verb, if it is a noun, if it is an article, if this verb is conjugated, if it's verb, this verb is conjugated at a certain mode, certain tense, certain person, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and then you start understanding that everything is extremely complicated, that this OCR is extremely powerful. It has helped us doing many, many things. But the further you go back into the past, the more problems you have, you get stuff. But, well, you need to choose. What do you do with this information? OCR, then, is extremely important, but it's not enough. So when you talk about digital humanities, when you need the text and not the paratext, page number, et cetera. Uh, for literary studies, literary, literary studies, you don't care the page number. What you want is the text. You need the lemmas if you do topic modeling, because then if you want to know how many times the verb to be is in the text, you need to lemmatize everything. You need to normalize the text if you're doing stylometry. Why? Because you're going to see how many times the words come back. But if it's written differently, then you count things that you cannot compare. So you need to normalize everything. You also need partially normalized text for reading. Well, you don't want to read a text that looks like the one that we have today. You want to keep certain feature of the past to make it look a bit like it was something written a long time ago. But at the same time, you want to make it readable. So you want to change a few things. To what extent do you do that? And finally, you want something that is non-normalized for linguists because they are interested. Where are variants? What is the alphabets that were used? What kind of signs, et cetera, et cetera. And this is the thing that interests me the most, is how do I prepare the data in a way that it could be used for computation? Um, one of the things that we have decided very quickly at the University of Geneva is that all these things were a bit complicated. So we would help people. And we will not be me, but pretty much everyone that we would have here uh, in our university and even in other institutions like Les Archives d'État du Valais, Les Archives de l'Ancien Évêché de Bâle, who uses our infrastructure because we thought, okay, it's too complicated, we're going to help people. And I thought it would be interesting to talk about that with you because 
we're always expecting university to provide tools, but these tools are not free. Not free because either you have to pay, either you have to develop them. You need someone to maintain it. You need to find solutions so that it works for everyone. So first it starts with the list of the things that you would do, like promote local upskilling so that like students and colleagues can improve their knowledge and competences. But you also want to offer scalability because you don't know how many projects you will have over time. At the same time, you want to minimize the cost because the rector or the dean calls and says, well, it's too much. Then you have not the money that you ask for and you have to do with what, you, what we gave you. The many, many, many problems that have led us to the idea that we would develop our own solution that is a bit like Transcribus that uh, uh, Krista showed you this morning, except that everything run on our servers, everything is done in Geneva, with machines, and if there is a problem, we can call the guy who answers, and I know him personally. It allows a lot of things. The idea is not here to sell this infrastructure, but just to tell you that we have decided to do such a thing. It's with a lot of tools that you need around this one. The first thing is IIIF. It's a technology that may, I hope a lot of people know, but if you don't, it's a way to distribute images. If you want to transform, images into data, you need to get these images. Where do you get them from? Well, IIIF could be seen as something like a big supermarket, and you say, I want this text, and it sends you all the images, which obviously simplifies the process if you want them to authorize all these images to get the information out of it. So we have our own IIIF server at the University of Geneva. Bern has it. Other universities have it. Don't, not all the universities sadly have them. Neuchâtel doesn't have any, for instance. Then we have our own system, it's called Fondu, Form Numérisé et Détection Unifiée des Incritures. It's our own instance of something that is called Iscriptorium that you can see here, and with which that you can transcribe, train models, but also process some data and export it so that you can start using it to do literary studies. And everything works, and this is a key step that you don't see, on our systems. On the left, you have this French version of his scriptorium. All the data runs on one machine. It's extremely powerful, but the problem is that the machine cannot grow. And in Geneva, we have decided to use these HPC clusters. Every university now has a supercomputer that usually scientists use to train models or to do their own experiments. And we thought, OK, humanities, we're going to use the same thing. And basically, what we have done is that we have plugged our system for HDR on their HPC cluster slash supercomputer so that we can have all our experiments done on these clusters, which means something extremely important. We're talking about costs, they pay the electricity bill. And we're talking about thousands and thousands and thousands of francs per year. And with that, now we have tried to develop an ecosystem to help everyone transform this analog data into digital data and it goes with classes, and it goes with a lot of uh, training that is offered by several groups. I'm thinking of Jean-Luc Falcone and Psychos, the scientific computing super team in Geneva to help everyone uh, be able to train his own model and deal with his own data. And once again, upskilling the community is the most important, training everyone and not using it as a push button if you want to do something a bit more complicated. Okay. You have this infrastructure, super. Uh, does it mean that you can do something with it? Uh -huh. It's not because you have a car that you have a driving license, and it's not because you have a driving license that you can drive the car. So what can we do? First thing, uh, probably a way to think a bit about how, what is this transformation from analog to digital? I give you here two pages of two documents that looks extremely different, right? The problem is that we want to extract information based on the segmentation of the page. So recognizing different zones inside this page. But the idea is the following. When you train a model of artificial intelligence, this big word that everyone uses, but practically what does it mean? You have to show him a lot of examples. Wouldn't it be better if we describe the documents the same way may they be manuscripts or prints, so that we have training data 
that is created by everyone using the same vocabulary, describing the same zones, which means that we can all gather the information that we have created to train bigger models. But it's a problem. It would mean that we have to describe the page on the left the same way we describe the page on the right. And they don't really look like another. You have two columns, you have an illumination, you have something that is handwritten later by a librarian, but it is the page of the and the number of the folio and not the page. On the right, you have completely different structure with a chapter, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the question that we've asked during a very long seminar was, how do we deal with that information? And we describe everything the same way. It could be a Greek manuscript, it could be a modern print, it could be a newspaper, it could be anything using the same information. So we have decided to divide the page in two big zones, around 10, so that we will describe all the documents and we could share the data and the way it is transformed afterwards. I'll come back to that. In blue, you have the main zone. This is where you have the text that you want to use. In green, you have all the headings, how the page is structured. In orange, what you have is the running title. Then you have drop capitals or illuminated, so special letters. And then you have the rubric that is this kind of heading, et cetera, et cetera. So it looks simple, but first I think that when I show you that and say, does it look the same? The question was not really. And actually we try to make it look the same by modeling a page. This is what we call modelization. So this is this process of transforming that into something that is coherent and then we can describe with the vocabulary and the vocabulary is the one that I've given here, running title, page number, text, body, drop capital, rubric, etc. And our approach is that not specific. It is not designed for a very specific kind of document. It should work for all of them. If you want to do that, we'd rather have some graphic approach rather than a semantic one. We don't care if it's a folio or a page, it's a number. We don't care if it's illuminated or just a bigger letter. It is something that is an initial letter that is put into, like is highlighted. And the idea is that by doing that, we will fit more or less to many documents from at least the Western world since the Middle Ages, which is already quite something quite big. And by standardizing that, we will help future mass digitization because everyone described the document the same way, put everything in the same box and train gigantic model of AI for segmenting documents. Um, how do you create this vocabulary? This is where digital humanities come back to play because you have two ways. The first thing is like, okay, three. The first one is like, I invent things of my own which is obviously something that everyone has told you, don't do that. The second is like, okay, I'm going to look at the code ecologist. And then you find two or three crazy guys, one in Berlin, one in Paris, and one uh, in Rome. And you end up with 1,500 entries. Can we train a computer model to recognize 1,500 entries that probably none of us here is able to make the difference between two, probably? No. Then code ecology is not good. What do we do? We're going to try to do that the way the computer scientist does. 10 entries, math, image, text, or something that we cannot use as well. Like in a way, it's way too complicated for code ecologists and way too simplified for computer scientists. So we had to know how we could do that. This is the digital part. And how we could describe it in a way that it would be useful for literary scholar. This is the humanist part. So this was really a digital humanities job to create this thing. We had to go through a lot of problems. So for instance, how to draw a line or draw a difference between very slippery categories. For instance, different types of headings. So you can see here, you have a rubric in red, and then you have the title of the play, the title of the act, the title of the scene, then who is present on stage, and then who is taking the, who is speaking, does it, all these things have to be in the same box or not? It is very complicating to say what is what. 
And it took us a month. We had a year seminar to try to name things and to see what goes with what. Second little game. I bet you hear a lot of things that look alike, but are they? You have a headpiece. You have a drop capital, you have a tailpiece, and you have an engraving. Do you think that these things are the same things or not? I mean, clearly, you have an illustration. Then you have ornamentation. Then you have some kind of ornamented texts. So is everything something graphic and we don't care? Or do we start to make differences between graphic stuff that means something, like the engraving, graphic stuff that doesn't mean anything, like the headpiece and the tailpiece, and graphic stuff that doesn't mean anything but has text, which is a different kind of information that we would need to process to retrieve the information that is inside. Basically, we can design anything, but we had to find a way. So we have ended up with this list of zone. The idea is the following. It has to be meaningful in terms of code ecology, describing the page. But at the same time, it must not be too much. Because otherwise, the computer will have too many categories and it will have problems to recognize the different zones on the page. You cannot ask him to make differences between things that looks alike except if you have tons of data that we will not, ha not have before a very, very long time. So we ended up with zones and lines, and we try to promote this idea that everyone would describe the document the same way, then we can put everything in the same pot to train bigger models the same way we do it for character recognition. We also have private areas because we had to think of people who have a problem we did not think of. Basically, you can put everything you want inside that place. So if you have a catalog in which you have entries, of course, I mean, we did not think that you would have entries. And then you can make the difference between the entries of a catalog and the entries of a phone book and the entry of an exhibition catalog, which is not the same thing that a sale catalog, et cetera, et cetera. So you have something you can do and you can put everything you want inside, custom zones. And the last thing that we've done is a syntax. Well, we have these types that have just shown here, but you can add more information. So this is a margin text, but it is a footnote. You can add a subtype so that the idea is that everyone names things the same way in the world, but at the same time, you have the possibility with a subtype to describe more precisely what you need. So there is some kind of a point that we share in common and we can share the data with still having the flexibility that we need to describe our own stuff. And finally, a number, why? Well, you can have several footnotes. You could also have several columns. So you could imagine main zone, column, a column, and hashtag one for the first column, two for the second column, et cetera, et cetera. And it's been a very, very long process. It seems obvious when you see it at the end, but to be able to describe this thing, because the first way you can transfer analog stuff into digital stuff by naming things, because by naming them, you can retrieve them properly. And when you have retrieved them properly, then you can process them. Now, let's say that we have recognized the zones on the page. Well, we have to read the characters, but little game. How do you transcribe this thing? Obviously, the problem is the first letter. Do you keep the long S or not? Well, it depends what you want to do. First thing is that if you want to do things on your own or not, or if you want to look at what the colleagues do. The second thing is that are you a linguist or are you a literary guy? Because if you're studying literature, you don't care about this long S. If you're a linguist, you're like, uh -uh, that is important because this is the history of the spelling. So this is not that easy. Second game, how do you transcribe this letter? It is pretty simple. It's the letter A. Then how do you describe the difference between these two? Are these letters the same or not? 
Well, once again, it really depends. You could say that it is the same or it is not. What is your objective? If you study the history of books, which is extremely interesting and extremely important because this whole knowledge has been published for years, decades, and centuries. This is important because it tells you where it was printed and it's not always clear. By whom it was printed and that is not clear as well. And it, depending who printed it where, it says something about the book that you're reading that you do not know before studying this. Would be extremely interesting to keep this information, but can you do that digitally? Not that easy. Last thing, do you see here where is the problem? Well, the two L are just one character. It's what we call a ligature. Do you want to keep that or not? Once again, it depends a bit about what, the, what you want to do. Uh, the thing is that ligatures played a very important role in the development of spelling in the world. Because when you can put one character to have two letters, well, you go faster. But then it forced, in a way, printers to stick to old spelling because they had all these pre preconceived series of characters that maintained archaic spelling that otherwise did not exist anymore when you were writing things down. So it had a major impact of the history of spelling. And once again, it says a lot of things about the book. So if you study things that are contrary, you do not care. But if you are interested in this kind of problem, this is extremely important. Basically, during three, during, until now, and still today, even I, myself, when we were transcribing things from old texts, we had three possibilities. First one was what we call the diplomatic transcription. What is a diplomatic transcription? It is a way that records the character as they appear on the support. Basically, you stick to what you see and you stay as close as possible to the thing that you see in the document. This is super cool for linguists, but it's hardly readable for the public. So some guys said, okay, we're going to try to find something a bit easier, and they call it semi-diplomatic. They change a few things just to ease the process of reading for everyone to be able to read things. And then interpretative, they thought, okay, semi-diplomatic is interesting. It helps the people, but what about 15 years old student in gymnasium? Well, we cannot ask too much. We should even simplify more things. So basically we ended up with a three tier system. Do not change anything, change a bit, change everything so that you end up with contemporary French, contemporary German, contemporary English, etc. What is interesting is that in the last few years, we have seen that computational sciences and digital humanities have changed the way we see things and we have shifted from a three-tier system to a four-tier system. First one that we could never have thought of is what we call graphic. Graphic would be the idea that you would keep every information that you find in the document. Suddenly it has been possible. Reproducing the distance between two letters recreating the shape of the S, because sometimes it's not clear if it's a long S or a short S when it's handwritten, but well, why decide? If we can keep this as it is in the original. Second one is the graphitic. It's the one that keeps graphitic richness. That is to say that all these variation, you really reduce it to extended types. You do not simplify too much. But you keep a lot of information, but you simplify just enough so that it's easy to put in the machine because you realize that the first version, you would need years to put everything in the machine and measure all the space and the shape of the S, etc. Maybe it will come one day, but we're not there yet. These two things describe the image. Basically, they want to retain information that is not linguistic, but how it is shaped on the page. And it's opposed to another level that describe the text. The first is graphemic. Basically, you transcribe things, but you align everything to the alphabets that we have now. And regularized, well, it's the transcription that is fully aligned to the spelling that we have today. So you have no trace that it was written 400 years ago, for instance. A lot of problem arises also that are from linguistics. So not sure that everyone can read the stuff that is on top. Dieu que feront de cils qui riches sont et aisent de l'avoir de ces siècles, 
Ne en eut non douceur, ne humilité, ne miséricorde de un son plein d'angoisse et de trahison et de... Well, it's easy for me, because I've been trained to read that like the newspaper. But for you, it's probably less easy. And for a computer, well, it is extremely hard. Where do you make a word start and where do you make a word uh, end? Once again, it's extremely complicated because you would need to show the machine where all these words start and begin, the start and end. But is it that clear? I'm going to take an example in French. I hope people will understand. Parce que would be translated as because. Que, everyone knows what it is. It's a conjunction. Parce. It's a word that does not exist in French. You can look it up in the dictionary, it does not exist. It only exists when you say parce que. What is a word? Where do you tokenize things? Is parce que one thing made of two things? Or two things, one not meaning anything? And then you start thinking again about, okay, what is the language that we're studying? Once again, to convert the data into something you can analyze. Well, you need to decide for this kind of thing because you remember post-tagging the fact that you're going to attribute to each token a linguistic value, the fact that it's either a noun, a verb, an article. Well, if you have split things in a way that is super complicated, well, you cannot attribute a category to something that does not have any. Bars does not mean anything. So segmentation of the text is another complex layer that you have to add. You've seen here that we're adding complexity and complexity and complexity. Either you can decide not to care about all these things. You put that in the machine, you put a model, you say recognize stuff, and it works. I mean, for some people, it's enough. But for a lot of people, transforming analog data into computational data is something that is extremely complicated because it's made of tiny decisions that you have to make pretty much every line on thousands and thousands of pages and even more. And you have several tasks. First, you need to recognize the layout. Then you recognize the letter. Then you recognize the tokens that are made of letters, etc., etc., etc. And it's an extremely complicated process. And it took us, well, basically, it's my habilitation. I've been working on that for four years, one step at a time. And I'm not presenting everything. Why do we do all that? Well, once again, as I've said, OCR is not enough. We need to go a bit further, try to understand things that we would not understand. And for that, well, we don't need only the text. And we have already seen that seeing what is on the page is extremely complicated because you would only always end up by caricaturing in a way what is in the text. Another problem is that you have the problem of formats. Ha. Huh. Data come in two formats, even texts. It's in Unicode. Which Unicode? And sometimes you have non-unicode characters, basically letters that do not exist. It's the case for medieval documents, for instance. So here you have alto on top, and then you have ti uh, at the bottom. They look like the same, but they are not. One of them is a standard for computer vision, the one on top. One of them is a standard for literature, the one at the bottom. Well, you need to transform things, but one is not designed to receive all the data of the other. Otherwise, it would be too easy. So basically, you have a cube and a cylinder, and you have to make one enter the second, and it's not designed for it. And you keep bumping into these kind of problems. So you have to invent solution. And TI, which is a community in which I've been involved for a very, very long time, is changing very, very, very slowly. So you cannot convince them to add some things that do not exist. Adding a little thing would take you two to three years and convincing dozens of people to add this little thing. So it's extremely complicated again. But at the end, we have slowly found a way to transform information. And then we start to have information. Why first is it information? Because we got stuff from the page but it's structured in something that the machine can compute and use and manipulate. And it has the data in a standardized format. 
if you study TI, I don't know if during your studies, if you had a look at what this thing is, basically it's an XML language. It's the way it's written here. It's the thing with the brackets everywhere and the quotation marks. And we have designed a way to store all the information from the OCR engine in Alto into TI in a separate element. Because it's TI, it's a DH standard. And also we have added in the TAI header a lot of data, metadata that we can retrieve automatically from libraries. Then I need to say something. Well, transforming analog data to digital data, everyone knows it here, but it's important to say it again. Well, you need the library to play with you. If they do not distribute information properly, well, you cannot retrieve this information and you cannot automatically add, automatically add the metadata that they have into the document that you produce. And it's an extremely long process to convince them to distribute this data in an open format that you could manipulate as a researcher. Because usually they give the data, but for machines, they give the data for uh, other like for APIs that we could not necessarily use when you're a researcher and you're a master student and you just need to get a bit of this information. And this is the key step. What we can do is generate an XML tree that would be seen as a pre-editorialist text. So you have to think that the idea is from the image, the digital facsimile, to produce something that is as close as possible to an edition completely automatically for thousands of documents. You press play and you have a system that download the images transform them via huge models that need to be able to handle any kind of possible documents that you would have in French, recognize when it, what is in it, get the text, transform it, add the metadata, and pre-edit the text. Only with a little YAML here, it's just a little document that say, it's Simon working for the University of Geneva because it's me. All the rest is automatic. You can get the IIIF, so the images, you can get the metadata via SRU, search retrieve via URL, if it is a service that is provided by libraries, which usually is the case. And with the three things that you have on the left, you can build all the metadata and prepare the transformation. Then you get an alto, and you can have the source doc in which you store all the information coming from the image. But because we have encoded things with segmento, which is this vocabulary to describe the page, I can transform that into TI automatically because I know where running titles are, where page numbers are, where notes are, where images are, which means that I can automatically encode everything into TI and pre-editorialize the document to build a digital library automatically. I say pre-editorialize and not editorialize because I don't think that the machine can create a critical edition not even an edition. It can create a transcription that is more or less enriched. An edition would be something else. I know that there is a debate now among scholars is, could it be seen that when you choose models, you're doing a critical act, and then you could say that it's a critical edition. I disagree with that. Critical edition is reading things and understanding what's in that. But this is a debate that exists, and I let you decide what you this? What is your position in this debate? But so the idea is to create automatically a lot, a lot of information so that we can study things. And then you end up with this thing that is a pre-editorialized version. Well, not easy to see, but when you do a bit of TI, you recognize here that, well, there is a page, then there is the header, you can put the title in it. Then there is the page number, you can store the page number in that. Graphic zone, if there is images, you can stock them into TI as well. And then the main zone, where you have a line, another line, another line, another line. And then the choir marks, if you need to say, well, this book ends here and starts here, information that is on the page, usually in every old print. You have reconstructed automatically the structure of the page into an encoded format via the standards that have presented. With that, that is extremely interesting, again, because you start getting data and more data and more data and more data, and you end up building a corpus. So we have designed free max, French early modern max, because it's the maximum corpus that we could get, where there is a first distribution here. 
And well, with that, you can study what's inside. You can see if things are changed. And we could start thinking of kind of uh, empty the holes. So more 16th century, a bit less of the 17th century. You've seen that I'm more interested into that than in other centuries. Well, with time, we will correct that. And the idea is that the more you have text, the more you can put them in a machine and then create a language model. Maybe you have heard of this bird language model that use transformers. Well, if you give the machine tons and tons and tons of texts, the machine starts to understand what these texts means in a way. So for instance, we can see here that king and queen and man and woman have the same orientation and the same distance because they have seen that in the text, well, they behave the same way. You can find man and queen at the same place that you could find woman and king, for instance. It finds patterns in the language that helps for all the tasks in NLP. If you remember what I've said at the beginning, well, we have not even reached the beginning of our study. We've just started raw text and we know where it is. And this text, we have more or less controlled the way it is transcribed. But we need to do linguistic normalization, transform it into contemporary French to help readers, limitize it so that we can do the topic modeling that we need, or stagging if we need to study the syntax, Named entity recognition, if we want to, like Nicolas, provide a map of everything that would be in a text. The interesting thing is that all these tasks need that thing. So the more you produce data, the more you increase the quality of your results. So then you can create more data that is useful. And it starts becoming a virtual, like um, a virtuous loop. Because the more you have data, the better the language model is, the more precise it is, the faster it is to inundate more data, retrain the model, then you have a bigger corpus that is even more precise than before, and you accelerate. The first problem, the biggest problem is to create the first loop. But then it keeps revolving together alone. And now we can already see that all our models are becoming better and better and better with time, and they will, we can pre provide better data faster, more layers of annotation that is even more precise each time we make a tour, uh, a tour of the circle. And at the end now, on top of the text that was our output uh, from the OCR, we can have this table, humble uh, salut reconnaissance, which is the beginning of a letter. We can say what is the lemma. We can say that what is the part of speech. We can see what is the normalized version for everything inside the texts with accuracies that are above 98 for each task. And it's only the beginning. With the end, what we have designed here is this pipeline. You have the digital facsimile and the metadata. You go through text extraction, analyzing the layout, getting the OCR. You have the auto files, that is this computer visual format, transform it into TEI, and then you pass it into the text annotator all the NLP tasks that adds the text that has been extracted. And you end up with a TI file that is a master file and rich that you can redistribute again. And it's also something that is important is that this digital data that took a lot of time to produce because it's years and years of, life, of, of my work, of my life. Well, you can redistribute it to the libraries that gave you the data because you can distribute it in RDF they can use it via EDERA, the system of the University of Geneva. Well, via DTS, that is another format to distribute text and to have everyone being able to use the text that you have produced. Or via IIIF, that the library can take, but you have just enriched the IIIF manifest with a lot of information that everyone can reuse. The idea is that we will share more and more information for two reasons, train model, upstream, but also downstream create all these processes so that if we all share them, well, one person develops something for everything. If we have the same segmentation of the layouts of the page, well, we have the same category. So if my script work to extract data from a page, it will work for everyone using the same description of the page. This is the virtuous circle, producing data, training a model, adding additional data, predicting new data that you can correct, 
and you keep making a loop for each model that you produce. This is the pipeline, the circle, the way it is to train artificial intelligence model. And at the end, producing all the data I've been talking about, you can finally do this curve. So now you see that this curve that seems pretty simple, just like a bunch of text, we needed to go through all these very, very, very long process to be able to produce it. But now that it exists, we can produce all the curves that you want. And I think that now we have a pipeline that is efficient for historical French, not for historical Italian, not for historical Spanish. So I'm working with these colleagues to help them develop as well their own pipeline, because the problem is that everything is very language dependent. So the problem is that it's really up to scholars to address the problem, but if no one does it, it will never change. And that would be a little bit my conclusion here is that first, this transformation is not that straightforward. It takes a lot of time, takes years, takes a lot of thinking, and you really need to be a humanist to be able to deal with this kind of data. Second thing is that it's really up to you. If it does not exist, no one is gonna do it for you. So you better start doing it yourself because otherwise you might wait years and years and years before someone doing it. But at the end, it's really worth it because you can finally study things the way no one could have seen it. And you have finally managed to create this digital information that is extremely rich and out of which you can extract a lot of information to write the articles that you wanted to write at the beginning. Thank you very much. And if there is any question, I will be more than happy. 44 minutes, that's okay. Mm -hmm. that I can share it with you. Thanks a lot, Simon, for the nice presentation. And I would like to open the room for questions. Um, is there something you would like to comment, ask, or get in, in a discussion with Simon? Yes. Thank you very much. Interesting. You showed the first page, yeah? and there you had this example of Sebian. Mm -hmm. And there must be a linguist or somebody who knows the words before and the words after to identify that this sound, c'est bien, mm -hmm. is tu c'est bien ou c'est bien dans le sens mm -hmm. c'est apostrophe. Mm -hmm. Ça peut être le même son, en fait. Mm -hmm. And so uh, there is needed uh, a first knowledge uh, that can change everything when there is a mistake done. Mm -hmm. And I think these are thousands of examples there. And there you need a lot of knowledge of the abbreviations uh, mm -hmm. about uh, above the, the E there. And how can you avoid these mistakes that creep in? Because after that seems like a, a machine of a lot of procedures. And when this first step is not correct, mm -hmm. <laughs> No, How do you cope with that? No, no, no. It's 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 a it's a very interesting um, problem. First one is that colleagues that are medievalists have decided that okay, data it was noisy because it comes from the manuscript. It's disgusting. The OCR does a lot of mistakes, so they did a bit what have shown. It's like process it, process it, process it. But each time you have two or three percent mistake, so. 2% plus 2% plus 2% plus 2%. And at the end, you have accumulated a lot of noise and all the processes that they had added to clean the data ended up having as much noise as at the beginning. It was just different noise. So this is a very big problem because the, the earlier it arrives, the more it impacts all the other layers because you're accumulating layers. They are one after the other. Um, Another interesting thing is that, um, how do you correct that? I was working with the uh, real NLP guys, you know, like uh, people who like they live with the machine, they sleep with the machine, they take the shower with the machine. And they say, yeah, Simon, you know, with these transformers and everything, we can do everything. It's like, I I I'm pretty sure I'll show you that not. Um, Usually when you want to train an identity recognizer, the Lausanne did it, I think they had 150,000 tokens. So they show 150,000 examples to the machine. 
and they discovered that it does not work very well. Yeah, it's not a lot. So what I've said is like, okay, I'm going to do it the philological way. I'm not going to annotate 150,000. I'm going to annotate 4,500,000 manually on four columns, which I did. And I beat the machine because they could add anything to improve the results. Well, they could not because there were so many examples that it was working. And I think it's an interesting answer. I did it in three months. So it's extremely boring. Uh, you, well, just put a podcast and you annotate data day and night, 15 hours a day. But at the end, you can try to do anything. It works. And a way to avoid problems in human sciences and digital humanities, usually it's very simple. Annotate example, provide example, and it will work. Then you always have complicated case and you will tell me that no. But this is the basic of artificial intelligence. I mean, you show him examples and it's like anyone. If you show him enough an example at the end, it would work. Not because it's artificial intelligence, just because it has enough example. And I think it's the best way to avoid any problem. And at the end, I don't think it's that costly. I mean, three months to create a data set for 16th century French in named entity recognition. Now we are better than those specialized in contemporary English. It just needed three months of work. That's okay. But for some reason, no one wants to do it. And then there is also something that is interesting between people who come from the computer science world and from the humanities in that for them, the game is to do as good as possible with as less data. But what they want to achieve is an efficient system. Me, I don't care. Efficient is 99.99. .99. If it's below that, it's not efficient. So I annotate more data. And I think that it's very interesting because it, sh it shows, at least in my experience, that we have a very different way to tackle the problem, but also it's a danger. We don't see this, the, the same problem in the same data. And that when you're doing digital humanities, you really have to pay attention to the fact that you are the humanist and that you have a different goal than all these computer guys who tell you that they know what they do and actually not that much. Oh, yes, they know what they do in their discipline, but not in mine. And so that is my solution. Annotate, 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 annotate. At the end, it will understand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, manuscripts that are not complete or mm -hmm. that are faded out or broken or whatever. Huh? And there it is also for me, uh, I hope that we find there also solutions because uh, how can you annotate in these cases where you have missing information? Statistically, I mean, it's the basic idea of any language model, bird-like or anything, is just like to predict a mask word. So what is interesting in this example where there are probably things extremely complicated and the, the, the bigger it is, the more complicated it is, but it's the, the logic that they use to train this language model. When you train a transformers model, you show him a sentence, you hide a word and you tell him, tell me what is the word that is hidden. And it's what is behind these language models that everyone talks about, bird transformers and all these things. So basically the thing that you're asking is something that we could really think we could tackle up to a certain extent. Then depends of course, how long it would be, but the logic goes with the technological advancement that we have. So I'm pretty optimistic. Once again, depending on the size of the hole, I've done tests with documents for which we had holes like that. So the size of a five franc coin. Um, so hiding apart, trying to see, it was extremely good. We could, we could find the word that we had lost by hiding it using these models. And even not using a BERT model, so I, I, with my students, we trained a, a language model that was just like a fast text. I don't know if people know what it is. Basically, it's a word to vec uh, model a bit better. And it worked extremely well with not a lot of, of data to train it. So I'm optimist, but by nature I am, so. Other questions, comments? Thank you very much.
do, do you think that you really uh, labeled yourself uh, real text and train on real text the the machine? Yeah, an artificial one too, mm. depending on the task. So I used data that I notated and data that was created artificially. Mm. I had this also this problem. I was working with someone in classical Greek, uh, a synthesis professor, but we really tried to think what you said that efficient. We was thinking that we just created artificially uh, annotated texts for segmentation. It was good results. I think that's if you think that in the future will be quite a kind of solution to have so many years spent. Uh, in really annotating texts to be trained when now we can fabricate texts that could uh, we in a pipeline generating a text that artificially then it's uh, it's learned because from my understanding of the, of the training process you don't have to have real data somehow mm -hmm. even you have to have some ages in, emphasized mm -hmm. but you can in fact make synthetic texts and that can be generated and learned. Yeah. What do you think? Uh, many things. Uh, the first thing is that, the, the, once again, I think that here there is a question of, uh, of what is a computer science guy and what is a philologist. Um, by, when I annotate my corpus, I know my corpus because I have seen every token that it's in it. And when I see a problem, because I have, even if it's extremely fast, I have seen what's inside. I took the time, I took weeks. I'm like, I know where it comes from. And I know where is the problem in the data. You can for sure add artificial data and it will work. The problem is not that it doesn't work. The problem is that when it does not work, how do you understand where the problems come from? And I have seen many times problems, and it was only my knowledge of the, the training corpus that helped me correct the thing. Doesn't mean that I'm against artificial data. I would even go further. Uh, I think that artificial data should not be used only to train models, but we could study artificial stuff. Give you a very simple example. I'm trying to study uh, the evolution of spelling, okay? The problem is that for it's logical, you have less data for 16th century than for 18th century because you had less prints, it costed more money. So you have, by definition, an artificial, uh, an imbalanced corpus. A, a lot of data at the end, not a lot of data at the beginning, okay? Well, what we have done is that we have modernized everything and then we have denormalized per decade every sentence which means that we basically have transformed everything into contemporary French. And then we ask the computer, create an artificial sentence of 1790, 1780, 1770, 1750, 1740, which means that we have the exact amount, uh, same amount of data per decade, the exact content. And then when you want to study the evolution of process, well, you're not biased anymore. And so I think that artificial data is useless from a certain perspective, which is the one that is used right now, which is just like create data to have the system to work better, because I think it's important to create your corpus. But I think that artificial data is also extremely interesting for much more of the things that I think are much more interesting. That is to correct the imperfection of reality in a way, to create this artificial data that we could that we could use. And, for instance, I'm thinking of everyone that is studying corpora, evolution of metaphors, of things like that. Well, you can create a perfectly balanced corpus over time, strictly comparable, without sampling issues. So, so those who do down sampling and sampling a way to correct problems that you would have in the data, well, you don't even have. Everything is strictly comparable. So for that, artificial data, I think, is extremely important. And they are, they are already starting more or less to do these kind of things. So I'm not technophobe, but at the same time, still a traditional philologist. Yes, of course. I'm just working on inscriptions, but first millennium BC. So this is really different. You have a different situation. You have so few data in comparison. Huh? Mm -hmm. 
but uh, for a case where you have a sentence, you understand the sentence, but there is a word uh, that you never met before. Uh, mm -hmm. And you need now a pattern, etymology doesn't help, and uh, you just, yeah, you are you are trapped because you understand the words before I have done this and then comes the house and the, the table and you don't know there mm -hmm. is something missing. This is one problem. The other problem is you have a word and two letters are faded out and you know these were three letters uh, and the last letter you have, you can read. It's mm -hmm. an S, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, can these kind of system that you use also help for these difficulties that you have a kind of a database starting from the last letter going back in this contents with a word before and uh, a subject this is the other thing yeah, yeah no um, uh, so answer would be uh, once again yes and no peut-être uh, as the, the normal say uh, Knowing this in, in the sense that, and I, I'm, I'm far from being the best specialist, probably even people here are better than me or online, but this artificial intelligence works with lots, lots, lots of data. And it's a problem for languages that are under-resourced. Uh, and when you don't have a lot of example, you, at some point you reach a point where, well, it could still work, but who knows. But, uh, so I don't know the language on which you're working. I'm, not even I don't no I don't know anything so I'm not gonna try to explain your case but I'm gonna go back to the things that I know and um, what we have seen is that working a lot on language can really help uh, for another one so up to a certain extent when you don't have enough data for something and you have a lot of data for another thing well you can use this big set of data and a tiny bit of your own so that it helps for your own problem uh, basically the HDR and the segmentation models that we've trained for historical French. They are not reliable in the sense that it, 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 they have not been tested for Italian, for Spanish, for German, but I use them on a daily basis on these languages. So, and there is a lot of tr techniques like transfer, et cetera, and a lot of work until now, from what I've understood, it has not meet the expectation, I mean, like the, that we had in them, but all these phenomena of transfer. So the computers knows how language works. So you can use this knowledge with another language. To me, conceptually, there is no reason it should not work at some point. Because, I mean, when you want to say something, you want to say something. And if it if you want to say something here, here, and there, well, it should help up to a certain extent. And the problem is the up to a certain extent for another thing. So then it's complicated and it depends on the amount of data that you have. But like, for instance, colleagues working on Alsacien, even though they don't have a lot of text, it works extremely well by just having data in German and French, and mm. it goes extremely fast. So, ah, Christa. <laughs> yes and no, because when I see my colleague in contemporary studies, they have much more. Uh, but I, I believe that George D.B. was right. It's like uh, Middle Ages, Renaissance, it, it's enough to be more the show of what you say and enough to dream a bit. So it's it's the perfect balance. I do not have a question, but I just wanted to say the last bit, what you said about what we take out of our experience um, and our knowledge we put together after a certain time. I mean, the text I'm working with, I can also not always understand what they say, and I can always, not always read what they say, but as, yeah, as linguists especially, you are aware of 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 some changes that that are frequent and that's why you get the knowledge and so the means we have today with recognition and what you showed is extremely helpful and thank you so much for pointing out that normalization is not everything because every time texts are normalized i cry because i cannot do anything again with them right it's no. just lost and i think that's uh, I feel sometimes like we have to to actually point towards this problem that that we have as linguists that normalization is a nice thing because it simplifies many things but it's also terribly sad if you do that because you lose a lot of knowledge. Yeah. Uh, okay. I will temper the optimism that I've, I've just uh, said I had. 
um, I really thought at some point that computer science, so maybe a lot of people here have not even heard word philology or don't know exactly what it is. Uh, basically, it's guys like me who are in a library in a cave and like uh, reading things no one read. Um, I thought that with computer science and all these computational philology, people will rethink a bit what they're doing with data and texts. It's like, oh, but it's not written the way I expected. So I'm going to think a bit about what I do. It's exactly the opposite that, are, that arrived, is that basically people say that they are building digital editions, uh, digital libraries, uh, using transcribus, which is an extremely great tool, but the problem is not the tool, is that if you, if you do not know how to drive, you can have a Ferrari, you won't go anywhere. And they create tons of normalized data. And I thought it would be, uh, because if you have eyes, you see that what is in the document is not what comes out of the OCR. And actually, people don't see that. And for a very long time, I thought, OK, philology is disappearing in the French-speaking part of the world even faster than in other areas. But even in Germany, it starts to be complicated. It, Italy is still a stronghold. It will not disappear for a long time. But it's an exception. But actually, no. Uh, we keep doing the same mistake, but we keep doing the same mistake with computers. So we create, I'm sorry to say that, but shitty text at a massive level. And as a linguist, you cannot do anything with that. It's transcribed in a way that is totally useless because you do not have a normalized version and a non-normalized version. You cannot measure the distance between the two, which is extremely important because there should be a convergence in the graphic system. And you would see that is what I'm working about on my habilitation. It's like the phenomenon of standardization, for instance, impossible. And the problem is that now in some scholars in France don't even see that a text is normalized. So we have reached a point and people don't understand what they read even at the academic level. And I'm extremely worried about the situation and I hope computer science would help. And actually it's doing a very, very bad effect. And all my work is trying to change and reverse the, the, the pattern, thinking that it's still time. And by distributing, they're, they're distributing layouts analyzer, HTR systems, but also the normalizer that normalize the data, because otherwise they say, oh, it's not normalized. I'm not going to use it. So no, you can produce data that pre-stand needs, but at the same time, you can normalize it so that you can have this useless text that you need for your studies. And by proposing an entire ecosystem, I really hope to change how it will be done, but we will see in 20 years. <laughs> okay, I have more of a conceptual question. So do you think um, the, let's say, modern um, language models from the big tech could um, give some added value to this kind of um, general language model or would you not mix those two uh, complicated uh, but basically yes i mean the language model that i've called d'alembert is trained okay, there is a pun because like bird models everyone that makes a, a a bird model calls its model with bird inside so the french have done camembert uh not sure we pronounce Camembert or Camembert. And then they have been Flaubert. Et so D'Alembert is D'Alembert. So it's a bird language model. So basically, it's a it's, it has been trained with Google standard systems. So you do use it? Um, yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, no, no. Of course. I mean, it, 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 the thing is that it was published by Google. Mm -hmm. But everyone is doing that because it's, it's more or less the best thing that you can do right now. Then the other thing is that, uh, yes, once again, because... It's more or less what I've said, like taking information from a big language model, tailoring it to your own need is probably the best strategy. So these big language models are extremely efficient, but you can train them for a very specific task. So we have this huge language model that has been trained by Facebook. It's called Camembert. Mm -hmm. It's for contrary French. It has seen texts that has been written between 2010 and today. Nothing before. It doesn't know the 20th century because it takes data that is on the web. 
Okay, so for him, Marcel Proust does not exist ever. I've seen it in Wikipedia, but that's it. It's not enough. So what we do is that we take this thing that have been created by Facebook, and we fine tune it on data from the 18th century. So basically, we adapt something that Facebook has made. We show him new data and say, correct yourself a bit to adapt. And because he has seen something that is about around 320 gigabytes of text, it's so big that they cannot even count the words that are in it. Okay, it's massive. It's the biggest amount of French data that has ever been gathered. It's more or less the same for German, it's more, a bit less for Italian, uh, but it's like this kind of size. Well, this model are useful because then D'Alembert is a mix. It's, some, it's a model that learned to speak contrary French. To him, we have showed a lot of historical French. At the end, it works. But yes, we are totally dependent. I mean, we, it could, we could even go further. All these stuff that I've shown here, like a third of the library, the Python libraries that I've used are paid by the GAFA or a bit more. I mean, like big, big, big companies. Uh, they are, I mean, like Forge, TensorFlow, and all these things. They, they, they are maintained by, by Google, by Facebook, and things like that. Clear, the last NLP library, I don't think Zalando, I think, uh, is the one that paid for it. So it's not only the data, it's pro probably the entire system. And I think it's an interesting question because like in, in we're always fighting to have these open source, this freedom, et cetera, which is an important thing. But at the end, I train it on the Mac, um, which is, uh, I mean, like, and okay, I could use Linux. It would be Lenovo. It would be not made in the US, but made in China. Does it change something? I mean, I don't really know what to think about that because like we 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 really think that we leaving this world of the GAFA and these big tech companies, and actually we are not at all. We are going even more in that, except that we're using things that are more or less open source. And at the end, we use hardware that is not open source. Thank you. Thank you very much. So thanks again, Simon, um, for the presentation. It was really very interesting. And thank you for being so active in the discussion. And before we now make a break, I would like to thank you that you were here. And uh, thank you for the invitation. Thank you.